Well, we have an exciting session to show how much that Texas is um, increasing its prowess in this area of neurodegenerative diseases. So it's my honor to introduce our first speaker, which you heard a lot about yesterday. Her early work as a graduate student where she provided the fundamental work on tau spreading. Now, Bess Frost, who's at UT Health, Sci Health Science Center in San Antonio, is continuing with this work, understanding the biology of tau and how it's altered during disease. So, Bess. Thank you, George. And I also wanted to thank um, the organizers for inviting me. It's exciting to be here. It's been a really great meeting so far. All right. No. You can apply also. <laughs> I plan to, <laughs> right? Okay. Okay, so I want to start out by reminding you about some, some of what we heard yesterday, which is that there's currently a major deficit for pharmacological approaches to treating Alzheimer's disease and many other neurodegenerative disorders. So the five um, FDA-approved drugs right now are widely prescribed. However, they don't actually modify the disease process, and they don't stop or slow the actual disease process. So they're, they're widely prescribed. However, they only work for in a, a limited subset of patients and only for a short period of time, um, depending on the patients. So in my mind, in order to develop drugs that actually modify the disease process and slow or stop the disease process, we have to understand the disease process. We have to know what's going on, what's different between the healthy brain and the brain that's affected by Alzheimer's disease. So you heard already yesterday about the plaques and the tangles in Alzheimer's disease. The tangles are made up of a protein called tau. The plaques are made up of a protein called amyloid beta. So while tau is most well known for its role in Alzheimer's disease alongside amyloid beta, as you heard from Mark Diamond yesterday, it also accumulates and is the primary neuropathological feature in a group of neurodegenerative disorders that are collectively termed tauopathies. So this is progressive supranuclear palsy. This is tauopathies that are associated with mutations in the human um, gene that encodes tau, um, cortical basal degeneration, and others. Also, tau accumulates in traumatic brain injury. So because of the widespread involvement of tau in many neurodegenerative diseases, the focus of my lab really is on figuring out how pathological forms of tau are actually killing neurons or causing neuronal um, and general brain cell dysfunction. So there's a lot of effort right now um, for drug development on blocking formation of pathological tau or preventing its spread. And obviously, I was involved in the early work on that, and I, I think that that's definitely a good way to go. But the reality is, when people come into the patient, come into the clinic with cognitive deficits, we now understand that they have decades of tau accumulation in the brain. So I think by the time people are actually coming in and getting diagnosed, they already have so much tau accumulation. Tau is already spread um, you know, significantly within the brain that we really need to understand what's happening as a consequence of tau that's causing the neuronal death because that, those might be alternative or additional targets for stopping um, neuro, uh, dysfunction of, of the brain. So if we can understand these nodes, in my mind, we can develop um, drugs or repurpose drugs that could potentially stop this progressive neurodegeneration. So we already know a lot about how tau is killing cells. So um, work from Malfini's lab, um, Pura Chi, I listed a few names here, um, have shown that tau causes an overstabilization of the actin cytoskeleton. So tau is, is a, it's a microtubule binding protein. It also binds directly to the actin cytoskeleton. And it causes actin to form bundles. Um, in um, the disease state, these are often referred to as Hirano bodies. So you have an overstabilized actin cytoskeleton. I found in 2016 that this overstabilization of the actin cytoskeleton affects the nucleus. So inside the nucleus, you have a coating of the internal surface of a nucle nucleus that's uh, formed by a protein called lamin that forms intermediate filaments. It's the nucleoskeleton. So the cytoskeleton and the nucleoskeleton actually interact with each other uh, by a, com a complex that spans the nuclear envelope. I found that the, uh, the um, uh, 
actin cytoskeleton induced dysfunction of the nucleoskeleton actually affects how DNA is packaged within the nucleus. So the nucleoskeleton serves as tethering sites for highly condensed heterochromatin, and the lamin nucleoskeleton is important for establishing the overall 3D structure of the genome. There we go. And then we've known for a long time that in postmortem human Alzheimer's disease brains, you have uh, many cell cycle, uh, markers of the cell cycle. So there's cell cycle activation. Neurons are normally post-mitotic, but in the context of Alzheimer's disease and tauopathy, those neurons are restarting the cell cycle. It's an abortive cell cycle reentry, so they don't actually divide, but they die. Um, all right, so the story that I'm gonna tell you about for the limited amount of time that we have today is new work from my lab, um, looking at the downstream consequences of heterochromatin relaxation, this opening of the genome. And the approach that we take um, is multi-system, so a lot of the early work and the mechanistic work happens in a fly model of, fly, various fly models of tauopathy. We also use um, brain tissue from mouse models of tauopathy that we get from collaborators, and we also use human brain tissue, mostly Alzheimer's disease, but we've recently um, acquired some primary tauopathy, um, post-mortem human brains as well. So this sequence of events, um, we have been able to connect each node and figure out what becomes, which, which node um, causes the next node by, lot, by work in the, the fly model. So the, the reason why I really like to use the fly model, <clears throat> along with what you'll hear about whenever people are introducing inver invertebrate model, you know, it's inexpensive, they have a short life cycle, lifespan, sequence genome, we have many genetic tools. But what I really like about the fly is that we can address causality using genetic manipulations relatively quickly. So the Drosophila model of tauopathy that I'm gonna be talking about today was uh, originally developed by Malfini. Um, it, exp we, it expresses human tau, specifically in neurons. They have a shortened lifespan, they only live to about 30 days, whereas normal flies live to about 70 days. They have locomotor deficits and they have progressive neuronal death. So at day one of adulthood, there's no neuronal death, um, similar to you know, human tauopathies, and then as they age, you get progressive um, neuronal death and other deficits like locomotor um, decline. So the way that, one of the ways that we measure neuronal death in the lab is just taking fly, aging, aging the tau transgenic flies and the controls, um, taking their brains, labeling with a, them, them with an antibody that recognizes the neurons. So here the neurons are labeled in green. And then we perform a tunnel assay. So this is uh, any, the cells that light up in red are cells that have DNA damage that's associated with apoptotic cell death. So you can see here a red cell in the tau transgenic uh, fly brain. So we just count these up and see how much uh, neural death is happening at any point in time. We also use locomotor activity as a measure of neurotoxicity, caspase activation, and lifespan. Okay, so getting into the project that I'm gonna tell you about today, um, I first wanna tell you about chromatin. So our genome is packaged into euchromatin and heterochromatin. Euchromatin is generally more open and transcribed. Um, heterochromatin is more condensed. There are two types of heterochromatin, facultative heterochromatin and constitutive heterochromatin. The facultative heterochromatin is more labile, it's going in and out of a heterochromatic state as genes are getting transcribed or silenced. Constitutive heterochromatin is almost always very, very tightly wound up, except for when the cell's dividing in general. So this type of constitutive heterochromatin is enriched near the, um, near the center, sorry near the centromere and the telomeres. In general, there aren't as many genes in this type of chromatin, and the genes that are there in general are not expressed at very high levels. So what is very, very enriched in these, this type of heterochromatic DNA are transposable elements. So what are transposable elements? They're DNA, they were originally described by Barbara McClintock. She won the Nobel Prize in Physiology um, in the 80s. She was the first woman to ever win uh, the Nobel Prize in Physiology. She found that transposable elements are DNA sequences that are capable of moving from one place to another in the genome. So there are two types. One, the retrotransposons. They're similar to retroviruses. They move in a way that's similar to retroviruses. So first, they are transcribed into RNA. They are reverse transcribed into DNA, and then they're reinserted in the genome in a new location. 
So in flies, these are gypsy and copia. In humans, these are line one and human endogenous retroviruses, among other types of retrotransposons. So there are also DNA transposons, which moved via a different mechanism. So <coughs> DNA transposons excise themselves from the genome and then jump to a new location. In humans, um, it's, it's thought that there are no longer any DNA transposons that are still able to move around. But in humans, we do know that there are some classes of, uh, some, some retrotransposons which are still uh, mobile. So why, do, why would we care about transposable elements? First, they're really, really abundant. 45% of the human genome is made up of transposable elements. So we're almost half transposable elements. Um, luckily, most of these transposable elements have, have lost the ability to mobilize. But as I said before, um, many of them are still mo mobile. So then if we look a, a bit closer, if a transposable element moves to a, lo a new location and it's in a, in a protein coding gene, it can cause deleterious mutations. If it mobilizes into a regulatory region, it, it can affect how that gene is expressed. And then the transposable element transcripts themselves can have regulatory uh, features. So since we knew in the tau transgenic flies and also in humans and also in tau transgenic mice that tau is causing this opening of heterochromatin and we knew that transposable elements are rich in heterochromatin, we thought perhaps that tau might promote uh, transposable element mobilization. So we started off in the fly model and we used a reporter of transposable element jumping. Basically, whenever a transposable element jumps into this specific hotspot in the fly, we get a fluorescent signal. So in controls, we had a, a low level of uh, like background fluorescence. However, in the tau transgenic flies, I hope you can appreciate how, how activated this reporter is, suggesting that transposable element mobilization is increased in brains of tau transgenic flies. So we wanted to know if this was a, this is at, at 10 days old, which is about a third of the way into a fly's uh, lifespan, a fourth of the way. Um, so we wanted to know if this was a progressive phenotype, so we, we looked over um, the age of the tau transgenic flies, and we saw while there was no reporter activation, meaning no transposable element mobilization at one day, reporter act was activated at 10 days and then still at 40 days, and we saw a progressive increase as the fly um, got older. So it looks like it's an aging-dependent phenomenon. So cells have two layers of control to keep transposable elements silent. I already talked to you about um, heterochromatin-mediated silencing, but I'll just uh, kind of outline this a bit more clearly. So when a transposable element is embedded within heterochromatin, and the, the, the DNA is very, very tightly wound up around it, transcription factors can't get in. And so the, the retrotransposon cannot be transcribed. If it can't be transcribed, then it cannot make another copy, obviously, and then mobilize. So it's silenced. However, if the heterochromatin around that transposable element were to open up, then the transposable element can be transcribed and then can potentially mobilize. So this is heterochromatin-mediated silencing. So the second layer of control over transposable elements is, is controlled by this small type of RNA, similar to microRNAs. They're a bit longer. They're made by different machinery. They're called pi RNA, uh, peewee interacting RNAs. So the, the pi RNAs bind to a, a retrotransposon transcript and then cause its degradation. So we wanted to know what the relative contribution of heterochromatin relaxation was to transposable element activation and if there was any role for the pi RNA mediated silencing. So we sequenced the, the, um, the transposable elements of the, we, we sequenced the gene, the, we did RNA-seq on control versus tau transgenic flies. We identified all of the transposable elements that were elevated at the RNA level in the tau transgenic flies, and we made nanostring code sets. So nanostring is a relatively new technology for looking at RNA transcript level. You can look at many transcripts at one time. So we made a code set that consisted of all of the transposable elements that are increased in the tau transgenic flies in the brain. So we took this code set and we induced um, heterochromatin relaxation in the fly brain and asked how those transposable elements were affected just by heterochromatin relaxation. So there's no tau here. And we saw that most of the um, transpos transposable, most of the transposable elements that were increased in the tau transgenic flies brains were also increased if you just promote heterochromatin relaxation. So it seemed like heterochromatin relaxation could induce uh, transposable element activation in the fly brain. So heterochromatin decondensation causally contributes to retrotransposon activation. 
We then took a look at the pi RNA pathway. So first, we looked at overall protein levels of a protein called PWE, which is central to pi RNA biogenesis. And we saw that, that just um, looking at the brain and, and labeling uh, with an antibody that recognizes PWE, it was obvious that uh, PWE protein levels were decreased in the brain. We saw the same thing by Western blotting in the tau transgenic flies, PWE levels were decreased. And then we wanted to look, take a more global look at all of the pi RNAs um, that are differentially expressed in control versus tau transgenic flies with the hypothesis that the pi RNAs in the tau transgenic flies would be decreased because this protein that's central to their biogenesis was decreased. So based on small RNA um, sequencing of control versus tau transgenic flies, we identified a number of pi RNAs that were differentially expressed between the two genotypes and found that most of the differentially expressed pi RNAs were depleted in the tau transgenic flies. So if you remember when I introduced pi RNAs and how they, how they work, this is consistent with a decrease in pi RNAs in the tau transgenic flies would cause an increased level of transposable element transcripts. Um, so, so we did that. We knocked down PWE in the absence of tau and asked how it affect retrotranspose on transcript levels in the brain using our nanostring code set. And similar to the heterochromatin relaxation, we found that most of the um, transposable elements that are increased in the tau transgenic flies are also significantly increased when we just knock down PWE. Now going the other way, if we rescue PWE depletion in the tau transgenic flies, we find that it decreases, significantly decreases most of the transposable element transcripts that are increased in tauopathy suggesting that tau-induced PWE depletion causally contributes to retrotransposon activation. So then going into neurotoxicity, does, does this, um, this, pi, this problem with, with pi RNA levels actually mean anything in terms of neurotoxicity? We depleted PWE levels by RNAi, no tau present, and found that, that PWE reduction was sufficient to cause neuronal death in the fly brain. And then we took tau transgenic flies, which have a significant amount of, of, of um, neuronal death, and then we rescued PWE levels and saw that rescuing PWE reduction suppressed tau neurotoxicity, suggesting that tau-induced tau PWE depletion causally contributes to neuronal death. So what I've told you so far suggests we, we find that pathogenic tau um, disrupts both layers of transposable element silencing, the transcriptional at the heterochromatin-mediated transposon silencing, as well as the pi RNA-mediated transposable element silencing. So we next wanted to know if transposable element activation was druggable. So there are obviously retrovirals, um, retroviral, um, anti-retroviral medicines that are, that are prescribed for retroviral infections. Um, we took one that's called 3TC. It's FDA approved for HIV and hepatitis B. It's a reverse transcriptase inhibitor, and we fed it to the tau flies. We first asked if 3TC, it's also called lamivudine for anyone who's in the field. Um, we first asked if it, if it reduced transposable element mobilization in the fly model, and we found um, that just feeding the tau transgenic flies, 3TC, significantly reduced this transposable element mobilization based on the reporter activation. And in terms of neurotoxicity, we found that just feeding the flies 3TC significantly reduced the amount of neuronal death that was present in the tau transgenic flies. Suggesting that transposable element activation is indeed druggable. Um, we've published a bit of work in, from, in using human uh, Alzheimer's disease brain tissue. This is a major focus of the lab right now. Um, so we took uh, publicly available RNA sequencing data from control, Alzheimer's disease, and progressive supranuclear palsy, and identified all of the, ret all of the retrotransposons that are increased at the RNA level. Um, in the tauopathy context compared to control. And we found that both Alzheimer's disease and progressive supranuclear palsy have, uh, have abundant levels of human endogenous retrovirus transcripts in their brain. So right now we're working to find out if those retrotransposons are actually mobilizing in the human brain. And we're also doing a lot of work in the uh, mouse models as well. Okay, so taken together, um, I, have, I have told you that relaxation of this tightly wound heterochromatin is causing, um, we, I didn't show you this data, but we, we think that the heterochromatin relaxation is what's causing the pi RNA depletion based on studies in the flies, um, which causes transposable element activation. Transposable element activation is druggable by an FDA-approved drug. 
So this work was recently published in Nature Neuroscience. Uh, Wen Yin Sun is the, a postdoc in my lab who is the first author on this work. There was also a recent paper this year um, by Josh Schulman's lab showing similar results that we saw. So we, we think it's really true. <laughs> Two labs have, have showed that it's the similar results. We're currently working on um, so since these retrotransposons are really similar to retroviruses, you can imagine that when they're expressed, um, the cell has, a, has an immune reaction to them. So we have a lot of data unpublished at this point that transposable element activation is also contributing to, to neuroinflammation. So that's a big area of interest for us as well. So this is my lab. Um, the bulk of this work was funded by um, an, an ROO that I got from an INDS, as well as the Owens Family Foundation. It's a local uh, family in San Antonio. Um, the Rainwater Foundation continues to fund this work. Uh, we got a private gift from Lisa Bailey as well. Uh, the bioinformatic work was done by uh, Habil Zare and Zare and Hanye Samimi at Texas State. The human data was collected by Nalu Tainer's lab at the Mayo Clinic. Thank you. <laughs>